Euronet Plus Panorama is a weekly review of European news broadcast by our network of EU radio stations. Welcome back to Euronet Plus Panorama. The Czech presidency got off the ground this week with the inaugural speech to plenary in Strasbourg. As ever, there are a lot of meaty issues on the to-do list. Our network takes a look. While it's true that a change in council presidency may seem a bit Brussels bubble, it can also mean a change in policy priorities. Yet with the Czechs taking over the presidency of the EU against the backdrop of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Prime Minister Petr Fiala's hands are fairly tied. Some had joked that Prague's five priorities would be Ukraine, 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 Ukraine and Ukraine. And this is not far off the mark. February the 24th, 2022 turned most of the plans we had upside down. Our priorities reflect this new situation. So Fiala told MEPs as he presented his key priorities for the coming six months in a speech in Strasbourg on Wednesday the 6th of July. Dagmar Ostranska is the director of Sofia's Czech Centre, an official body of the Czech government established to promote Czech culture abroad. She explains to Bulgarian National Radio why the Ukraine question weighs so heavily on Prague's shoulders. In the context of the partial occupation of Ukraine, the Ukrainian flag is flying from every state building in the Czech Republic as a sign of solidarity. There are many people who feel compassion, in part because of the memory of our own former occupation by the Soviet army and the defeat of the Prague Spring. Ukrainians have been the largest minority in the Czech Republic since before the war. But from 200,000 before the war, they have now grown to half a million. The motto of the Czech presidency is Europe is a task, and it comes from the 1996 speech by Václav Havel, who spoke about Europe as a task, as a question, and about the new role of Europe. One area worthy of focus right now even though it may seem premature, is Ukraine's post-war reconstruction. Or so the Czech ambassador to Latvia, Jana Hinkova, tells Latvia's radio. Yeah, we strongly believe that we have to open this debate during our presidency already. For the first, it might be a kind of inspiration for Ukraine in its fight. For the second, we have to prepare our structures and our system for the hopefully very soon upcoming period of reconstruction and rebuilding of Ukraine. We would like to focus the debate on restoring the critical infrastructure, ensuring basic services, strengthening resilience and economic recovery and stability of Ukraine. Under the Czech presidency, we will organize a forum for Ukraine already at the end of August, beginning of autumn, which will offer a platform for discussion about all relevant issues connected to the Russian aggression and about how the EU and the democratic international community could contribute to rapid reconstruction of Ukraine. Lithuania's ambassador to the Czech Republic, Laimonas Talat Kelpsha, quips to Zhinyu Radias that one Ukraine-related job the Czechs had promised to do was already done and dusted before they even took the reins from France. Not so long ago, when Prime Minister Fiala outlined the priorities of the presidency a couple of weeks back, the Czech Republic solemnly announced that it would seek EU candidate status for Ukraine during the Czech presidency. But today this is already a fait accompli. The train has moved on, as they say. Of course, everyone in the Czech Republic is very happy about this, but this does not diminish the importance of the other priorities that the Czech Republic has set out. Czechia is getting its feet under the table at a time when Europe is facing myriad interlinked crises. A war on the Union's doorstep, a refugee crisis, a lack of energy security... And there was a firm focus on these areas in Fiala's priority rundown. In an interview with Kuku Radio, Marika Lintam, Director General of the European branch of Estonia's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, explains that this is a no-brainer. Uh, 
In presenting their plans, the Czechs have clearly put their focus on this war in Europe, on how to help Ukraine even more, both with general support and with the reconstruction of Ukraine, on how to further raise the price of war for Russia through sanctions, and of course also by helping war refugees in Europe. But energy security is clearly very central too. Certainly, with a new heating season on the way, the Czech Republic, as the new president, wants to review where we are on this topic and the state of our gas reserves, to discuss together what other measures can still be introduced. This certainly has an important place. Ambassador Talat Kelpsha adds that Prague is a firm advocate of making joint gas purchases, as the European Commission has suggested. One item on the agenda is the joint purchasing of energy resources. At the start of the COVID pandemic, we entrusted the European Commission with the right, the power to buy vaccines on behalf of the entire EU. A similar model is now being proposed so that countries, maybe not all of them, but at least those that wish to do so, can buy as a collective, taking into account the high energy prices. In addition to the Ukraine situation and energy security, the Czech priorities include strengthening Europe's defence capabilities and cyberspace security, and making Europe, its institutions and its economy more resilient. MEPs gave the package their clear support. German MEP Nikola Beer is optimistic about Prague's prospects of making a difference during its term. But the Renew Europe member urges it not to forget its long-standing goals in the face of all the other issues it is forced to contend with. AMS shares her comments. The Czech Republic stands for EU enlargement. Prague knows how to mediate between East and West. It can use crises to create opportunities and build resilience. The Eastern Partnership bears the Czech signature. Prague launched it during the last presidency in 2009, opening the door to dialogue between the EU and, among others, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Moldova and also Ukraine. The EU needs this courage and this foresight to reposition itself. Externally, the buzzwords are common energy policy, fewer dependencies, in short, geopolitical. But we need to look internally, too, at our own engine room. We must be able to make faster and better decisions if we are to carry global weight. And these reforms, for the EU's own sake, cannot wait. The Czech Republic must not tap on the brakes here. Rethink, rebuild, repower also applies to the positioning of the European Union. Here, the Czech Republic must be the driving force that the EU needs. I ask you to pay attention to this. During the debate in Parliament, various other MEPs underlined the need for internal reform in the EU, in line with the wishes of European citizens. Among those, Manfred Weber, President of the European People's Party. Now, we can only survive in confrontation with Putin if Europe is the lighthouse of free democracies in the world. That is why we finally need a convention to renew the idea of European democracy. We must take the people of Europe seriously when it is about European decision-making. Peter Fiala's inaugural speech also touched on food security as one aspect of Europe's strategic resilience. Indeed, a delegation of MEPs visited the Polish-Ukrainian border in late June to lay the foundations of a plan to reduce the risk of a potential food crisis both inside and outside Europe's borders. The topic was raised in plenary this week, with MEPs on Wednesday adopting a text on addressing food security in developing countries. One proposal is for Europe to create so-called green corridors through which Ukraine can send food to third countries via the EU. According to Renew Europe member Jana Tome, food security affects us all directly, as very few countries are able to supply themselves with all the food they need. But it also affects Europe indirectly, she tells Cuckoo Radio, as when other parts of the world cannot access food supplies, this has a knock-on effect on our borders. 
A real global food crisis will probably hit next year. We know very well from recent history that when there is a famine in Africa, for example, refugees head our way. All sorts of conflicts, civil wars and so on arise there. So even if we were well supplied with food ourselves, this would not mean that we were free of risk. And sadly, this is not the case. Ukraine and Russia are two countries on whose production most of the world depends. I'm not saying that we're on the brink of disaster because of this, although some experts say we are. In reality, food security is a much broader issue. I think that Russia's aggression against Ukraine was more of a catalyst here, because the food market has not been regulated for decades. So I'll sign off there. Join us again next week for more insight into the news as reported from around the EU.